Scratch's orange and gray variable boxes work okay, but they get a little monotonous after a while. Today I'm going to show you how we can create custom graphics and code them to make our own really cool scoreboard screens like this one, or this one, or maybe even something like this. It's really not too hard at all, let me show you how. So I'm going to be showing you two different methods here for converting a plain old variable in Scratch into something a little more graphical that will allow you to tweak colors and play around with design and do something a little bit prettier. In order to do that, we're going to have to start with a set of graphical numbers. And you can see that I've got something set up here where I have some pixelated looking little number showing up. The first costume is one, and then we go down the list here until we get to nine, which is the ninth costume, and then the tenth costume is the digit zero. We're gonna start by placing these guys down on the screen here. You can see that I've just got a simple loop here where we have a starting position, and we just shift these characters to the right by 22 pixels each time. Along the way, though, we're gonna stamp these guys with a number. I've set up a local variable here. Local variable meaning when I went to make a variable, I clicked on this little button here that says for this sprite only before I named the variable. Now that's very important because when you're working with clones and you use a local variable, each of the clones will be given a different number and that's how um, this code will know which digits to change with, with, with which number. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to stamp uh, the first of these uh, digit uh, clones with the number one and the second with the number two. And um, just to demonstrate that, I'm going to have each one say its digit value when it's created on the screen here. So let's go ahead and do that. And you can see that our first digit is one and then two and then three. And we're going to be able to use that number to tell these clones um, which ones need to change at any given time when our value of our score down here below changes. Okay, so let's get rid of this say here. Now we're going to want to begin a loop here where we're going to be switching costume forever to match the value of our score. If I do something simple here like switch costume to score and I run my program, you can see it's going to be constantly going around here updating it to match whatever the score is. So if I set my score to 1 here, for example, you can see that my, my readout now goes to 111. And that's what I would expect to happen here because every single one of these guys is looking at the score and changing it to costume one, which will give us a number one. Now, we want each of these guys to operate differently though, right? We want, in the case of a bigger score like 100, we want that first clone to show the number one and the next two to show the number zero, zero. So, so we're going to do that by using a block here that says letter one of Apple. This basically looks at any string of text, in this case Apple, and returns the first character or the second character, which would be a P in this case, of any information that's put in here, including a variable. So if we go in here and go grab score and put it where the word Apple is, now we can actually identify individual uh, digits inside the score. So my score, let's set it to 100 here. And if I look at letter one of score, it comes out as one and letter two comes out as zero and letter three comes out as zero as well, perfect. So if I take this green square modified with the score variable here and I substitute this number here with the variable digit. Now something interesting is happening here because every single one of these guys has a different value for the digit variable. So every one of these guys who reads this block now, if I plop this into here, is going to read this differently. The first guy who is stamped with the number one is going to be looking at letter one of the score. The second guy is going to be looking at letter two of the score. And the third guy is going to be looking at letter three of the score. Now watch what happens when I change my score by 20 here. I'm at a score of 120, 140. Let's change it by 25 instead. And you can see that my numbers are keeping up nicely with the score variable now. 
So I've pretty much licked the problem. The only issue though is um, if I try to enter a smaller score, let's get, set the score back to zero here again. And now if I try and change the score by one at a time, for example, here you can see it's going up by hundreds. Why is that? Well, the number I'm entering here is only has one digit in it. So the software is looking at the first letter of the, of the word here, and the first letter is indeed one, so it's putting it into this spot here. There is no second letter or third letter, and that's why these ones aren't changing. So in order to get a system like this working, before we process this, we're going to have to change whatever the score is into a three-digit number. And that will clean up this little issue here. So that's fairly easily done. It's going to involve some if statements though. So I've set up a couple of if statements here. I've pre-baked these. So what's happening here is if my score only has one digit in it, the length of the variable score, if it's one, then we're just gonna add a zero, zero onto the score and we're gonna write that to a new variable called display score. So the display score, instead of being one, is gonna end up being zero, zero, one when we add one to the score. And that's gonna keep these digits in line with each other. If the length is two, then we're gonna add a single zero in the in front. So it'll be zero, one, zero for 10, for example. And if it's a score of three digits or more, then we're just gonna make the score equal the display score here. So now we just have to modify this block a little bit here. Instead of switching to the score, we need to switch to the display score. And now we have a uniform three-digit number coming in here, and each of these will be updating based on the placement of the number inside that three-digit code here. And that should solve all our problems here. So let's go ahead and run a test here. We'll set the, set the score to zero, and our numbers go to zero, and then we'll start changing it. Now to, um, to save time testing this, I've programmed these cats to add to the score variable here. So if I click on the one on the orange cat here, you can see my score goes up by one. My green cat here adds 10 to the score. So we get 14, 24, and the reddish one here changes it by 100. And you see that no matter what I do to this score, as long as I stay below 1000, my score always perfectly matches the score variable here. So that's method one, it works quite nicely. I wanted to show you guys a more advanced method that uses a little bit more elegant code here that um, that's just a little bit more difficult to understand, but I think it's worth the effort if you guys want to take a deeper dive into this process. So let's jump over to our method two sprite here, which I've colored the numbers green in just to differentiate them. So you can see that we coded things a little bit differently here. For starters, every time we create a clone, we're actually moving to the left instead of moving to the right, which means that our first digit is gonna be the ones digit, and then moving to the left, our tens digit is gonna be the next one, then our hundreds. The benefit of doing it that way is that our number is gonna be expandable. Right now I'm making three numbers across a row here, but if I change this loop to a five or a six, we end up creating massive numbers that will help us out if we're in a high scoring game. So this is system here is a little easier to set up if you're working with bigger numbers. Now, the other thing you've noticed here is that this local variable that we're changing here, I've changed the name of this to D instead of digit, but it's really basically standing in the same place. This is an identifying number that's going to uh, let these clones tell each other apart. But the number that we're stamping them with is actually matched up with the with the digit place of this number. So the first time around this loop, we're gonna create the clone and the D is gonna be set at one initially. But then as we come around this loop again, we're gonna multiply that number by 10, which will make the second digit here, the middle one, have its ID number be 10. 
and the third one is going to have an ID number of 100. And then if we were to go with more numbers, it would be 1,000 or 10,000. So um, you can see that right here. If we hit the green flag here and they say their ID number, we've, um, we've got our six guys still being made here. And the ID number of this six guy is 100,000. Let's change that back to three and you'll see that this guy's digit is 100. So he already knows his, uh, his digit placement based on this ID number. Let's get rid of the say block here. And now once again, we're gonna be changing our costume forever in order to keep track of where that score is going. So we're gonna need our score variable again. We don't need the display score in this case because our new system is gonna actually account for the fact that we have a different number of digits depending on what our score is. And that's one of the things that's gonna make it a little easier to expand this. So we wanna switch costume in this case to a, some, a mathematical formula. We're gonna take our score and divide it by this digit value. And then we're gonna take the output of that, whatever that number is, and we're gonna find the floor of it. Now floor is a term from calculus that you guys won't have seen in math in high school until a fairly advanced age and you certainly won't see it in elementary school. It just means round the number down to the nearest whole number. So if I have a number like 2.4785, the floor of that number would be two. Um, I can show you that right now. So the floor of two point, but any number like this is going to end up being the next whole number. Uh, the opposite of that is the ceiling, and that's just rounding it up. So the ceiling of this big complicated number would be three. So it's basically just rounding it up or down to its nearest whole number. So we're gonna take this formula here, the score divided by that D variable, and then round it down. Now, why we're doing that doesn't seem immediately obvious. So what I'd like to do is show you guys a table of values like we do in math class and see how under different scores, how this formula relates back to the costume that this guy is supposed to be wearing. So this table here shows what the score divided by the D variable would be under different circumstances here. So let's start, let's say we have a score of five going um, in our game right now. So this hundreds digit here, the one that's marked with the number 100, it's gonna divide itself by 100. So the score of five divided by 100 comes up with a value of 0 0.05. Now the floor of that, it's gonna be zero, right? Because that's the nearest whole number. So that first digit in our score is gonna be zero. The second digit here, the one that's marked with a 10, we're gonna divide that number five divided by 10 and it comes up with 0 0.5. And again, the floor of that is zero. The third one, we're gonna divide by one. So five divided by one is five, which the floor of that is still five. So our final output here is zero, zero, five. And so the first costume will switch to a zero, the second will switch to a zero, and the third one will switch to a five. Perfect. Okay, so now let's try a bigger number. Let's try a two digit number in there. So if we take a number like 32 with our score, if we divide that by 100, we'll get 0 0.32, which still adds up to zero. Divided by 10, it becomes 3.2, which gives us three. And the third digit here, 32 divided by one is 32. Now this is where things are a little bit more confusing. So it can't switch to costume 32. What's gonna happen then? Well, there are 10 available costumes. So it's gonna switch through 10 costumes, then do it again, then do it again, and be left with two of them. Then it's gonna go to the first, second costume. So basically when you have costumes that are more than the number that's there, especially if you've got 10 costumes here, we can basically ignore this whole first digit and the output is going to end up being just the second digit. I hope that makes sense to you. So it's actually go, cycling through 32 costumes, but because there's only 10 available, it's burning through the first 10, then the second 10, then the third 10, and then on the fourth time around, it stops at the digit two, and that's the costume it's gonna be wearing. So our final output is gonna be zero, three, two, 
which gives us the number 32, which is exactly what we were looking for here. Let's try that one more time with a number with the 100 digits. Let's say we're doing the number 157. You can see the same kind of thing happens here. So divided by 100, we end up with a number that's basically one when we take the floor of it. This number here divided by 10, it's 15.7 and the floor of that is 15. So just like with this number, it's gonna go around once and then the second time around stop at five. So the output's gonna be five. And for the third number, we've got 157. And again, it's gonna ignore those first two digits and put out a seven. So our final output is gonna be 157. So no matter what our score is here, uh, whatever the input score is gonna basically match the output score with the handy zeros put in here. So we no longer need an if statement to keep track of our zeros. And we're also able to expand this out to as many digits as we want it to. Let's go have a look at that right now inside our program. So now that this is all plugged in, you're seeing our score is zero. And now when we add one to it, you can see both these numbers are keeping track perfectly of what our score is. Let's try adding 10 to it. Our score is 15 now, 25. Let's add 100 to that, 125, 225. And no matter what we do to these numbers, they basically keep tracking with what the score is going to be. So now here we have a perfectly aligned little numbering system that we can use in our games that will let us control the look and feel of everything we're doing. Perfect. And as I said, you can expand this out to any number of digits you want to. It's We just have to go around this loop a couple more times. Let's say we went six here. Then we would end up with a giant number uh, based on 100,000 here. And you can see... Let's add some more digits to this. So 421, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And when it rolls around to the next number, you can see it automatically takes that into account. So this number is basically expandable out as far as you need it to be just by making that loop go around to the maximum number of digits that we're going to want to add there. So there you have it. That is two different ways to do a complex numbering system in Scratch that will let you really put a nice graphical touch on your projects. I hope you enjoyed this. Please go ahead and make a scoring system for me and send it to me. If I see a really cool implementation of what you learned here today, I'll show it on my future live streams. Thanks a lot. This has been an excerpt from the Chromeworks Technology Livestream. For more Scratch tips, tutorials, game reviews, and interviews, subscribe to this channel and make sure to tune in to our weekly live show, Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on YouTube.